Hello. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 83rd New Social Environment. I'm Lewis, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between the artist Sean Leonardo and the Rail Zone art scene editor Sarah Rafino. We're also thrilled to have the poet Sarah Sala here, who will read to close today's program. And now to introduce today's host. Sarah Rufino is a writer and an editor, and she is the Brooklyn Rails Art Scene Section Editor. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Lewis. Um, it is an honor to speak with Sean today. Um, just gonna give a little intro uh, to his work before he uh, gives a little demonstration uh, slideshow. Sean Leonardo's multidisciplinary work negotiates societal expectations of manhood, namely definitions surrounding black and brown masculinities, along with its notions of achievement, collective identity, and experience of failure. His performance practice, anchored by his work in Assembly, a diversion program for court-involved youth at the Brooklyn-based nonprofit Recess, is participatory and invested in a process of embodiment. Leonardo is a Brooklyn-based artist from Queens, New York City. He received his MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute, is a recipient of support from Creative Capital, Guggenheim Social Practice, Art for Justice, and A Blade of Grass, and was recently profiled in the New York Times. His work has been featured at the Guggenheim Museum, the High Line, and New Museum, with a recent solo exhibition at Maryland Institute College of Art. From fall 2018 through spring 2020, Leonardo enacted socially engaged projects at Pratt Institute as the School of Art Visiting Fellow. Hi, y'all. Good afternoon. Uh, go ahead and uh, put up the slideshow. And what I'm going to do, Sarah and I decided it would be proper to sort of just give a backdrop to our conversation today as a way of informing what we're gonna talk about, in a, but also as a way of really illuminating the diverse aspects of my practice. So go ahead in the next slide, please. I'm gonna start with the assembly program that Sarah mentioned in my bio. Next, please. Coming back to you now. One second. One second, y'all. Okay, so Assembly is a program which I co-founded with the nonprofit Recess, which is based in Brooklyn. I'm gonna give you some real general strokes here and so the nuts and bolts as to how we arrived at conducting this program, but I've been serving as the lead educator for Assembly for the last nearly four years. It is a diversion program which works in conjunction with two partners directly in the court system. As, and as of most recently, we are, we are collaborating with the DA's office in Brooklyn. Essentially what this means structurally is that any young person aged 18 to 25 who has been arrested on misdemeanor and most recently felony charges, rather than have their cases pursued in court, they join me for a series of performance-based workshops. And after a four week cycle, their records can be, their cases can be closed and their records sealed. The work itself is invested in a process that I call physical embodiment. And what we do is look at the possibilities of how a story can be conveyed through body language. And to do so, we remove language altogether. And the work is organized around these two principles that are both enacted when we look at how a story is conveyed through the body because it's my argument that there's a deeper, different truth to be found through our bodies and the way that our bodies hold these stories and the way that our bodies hold on to trauma. And so by removing language, we allow the storyteller to externalize the story quite often for the first time to see it play out through someone else's body and see that story through a completely different set of eyes. But also it allows the group collectively to analyze that story and more carefully read and gather meaning at the heart of the story. 
and it allows the group to collectively investigate and look at the systemic forces, whether structural, environmental, that may have led to that moment. And so what we're looking for is a different way to articulate these stories without the use of words. Quite often the words that would be used are those which have already been imposed onto these black and brown young bodies by the media. So we're looking for ways to set these stories, to tell these stories on their own terms, to find a different language so that their bodies, their minds can be freed and so that they do not feel that their identities are defined by this experience with arrest or incarceration. What you're seeing here in these images are not the program as it is enacted anonymously. Next. But what I am showing is one of the opportunities that we've taken for what happens in an intimate workshop to be shared with a public. Next. And so what you're seeing here are young people who are inviting others in to occupy their memories as a way of recalling that story, but also as a way of asking others to embody that story and sense it within themselves. Next, please. And next. I'm going to trace the work that I'm invested in in assembly to earlier practices, to early, earlier performance works. The first being what you see in front of you, I Can't Breathe, which was a four-year cycle of performances in many different spaces conducted, as you see here in art fairs, in, in museums, in other institutional spaces, but also in high schools, housing developments, out on the streets, community centers. And it was a piece in which participants were invited to what they believed to be a self-defense workshop. And over the course of 30 to 45 minutes, the weight of police violence would be addressed. And it would be addressed in terms of what they were learning as self-defense techniques that they would be experiencing both as aggressor and victim culminating of course in the maneuver which the nypd still refuses to be called a chokehold and the impossibility of eric garner having escaped that maneuver and also the embedded contradiction of self-defense being equated with resisting arrest for certain bodies. Next, please. This piece entitled The Eulogy, which also traveled to different contexts and places over the course of three or four years, staged as a New Orleans style jazz funeral procession in which I invited audiences to collectively mourn the lost lives of young men of color who have been killed by the police. This one here being staged at the High Line and moving along an arc in this newest portion of the High Line, culminating at this moment. Next, please. And then finally, this performance, which was staged in 2018, entitled Primitive Games, in which I invited four distinct communities all with, unique, with a unique relationship to gun violence, to participate in workshops separately. The four groups being the NYPD, military veterans, a group I coined citizens impacted by street violence, quite often that being gang-related violence, and a final group of firearm enthusiasts. And they met at the Guggenheim, which was transformed into, glad into a gladiatorial arena inspired by Calcio Storico, a game, the most brutal of games, that is still currently being held in Florence. And so this performance invited these four groups to be divided into two teams along much more elusive lines, not distinctly equated with their group affiliations. And then they were asked to debate the issue of gun violence, but 
without the use of words, only through body language. Next, please. And, to, and then finally, I will address in our conversation how this work both fuels and is in turn fed by the work that I do in my studio, this most recent work, this most recent work all being brought together under the exhibition, The Breath of Empty Space, which was set to be held, exhibited at MOCA Cleveland just weeks ago. Of course, many of you know about its censorship. This work, and I'm just showing a few works here, this work being of Eric Garner, next. Stefan Clark in Sacramento, next. And the next three works, occupying a more imaginative space and employing images that to me connoted or explains what happened to a young man uh, that was killed in my own neighborhood when I was a young child in something that was called the Rodney King case of Queens. The young man being my neighbor, Freddy Pereira. Next. This case or this tragedy, there being no visual evidence. So what I decided to do again is pull visuals that to me explained what the medical coroner, um, coroner uh, explained in his testimony. Next. Just stay here for a moment. I wanna speak specifically the part to the participants. I know many of you are here to listen to me respond to the current controversy, not only uh, regarding the censorship by the museum, but also the more recent pushback and visible grievances, uh, the visibility around the grievances that have been aired in the media. What Sarah and I have uh, decided to do is weave some of those responses into a much larger narrative arc. And what I will tell you all that, is joining, that are joining us is that I plan on not being diplomatic nor defensive, but I must say to you that because of the ongoing legal dispute, there are certain things that I should not say. But in that, what I will attempt to do is at times speak specifically to the controversy and the things that have been said regarding the cancellation of the exhibition, but also the things that have been said against my work. But more importantly, I will try to zoom out, particularly because the most two recent articles were too lazy to pose larger philosophical questions surrounding the work. And I think it's these larger questions that are bigger than me, are bigger than my drawings, and are bigger than this current moment. And these are the philosophical questions that I believe are related to art and art production. Thank you, y'all. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Sean. Um... That all being said, just to make sure that everybody is aware of what has happened in the past few months, um, Sean has an exhibition. It was previously on view at MICA um, and was supposed to open in Cleveland in June. Um, and it was, the show was canceled um, and very, there, very little information was communicated to Sean. Um, attempts at communication were not clear. Um, ultimately, the director of the museum did step down and issued an apology, um, but people have continued to sort of, um, I, I, it seems sort of um, mine the potential conflict um, in, a, uh, in a way that leads to further division as, as opposed to potential uh, generative conversation. Um, and from what I've read in the articles, um, a lot of the resistance to the work seems, uh, seems to be that people actually don't understand Sean's practice as a whole. And 
Um, so what I'm hoping we can do is, is talk about some of that background and, and fill out some of that story. Um, so we will talk about the controversy when it feels appropriate, but also, I, as Sean said, we're interested in talking about him as an artist and the larger philosophical um, questions that his work uh, brings up um, around images, who gets to use what material, um, how trauma is experienced and presented, how communities grieve, um, these sorts of things. Um, so, Sean, you are an artist, you're an activist, you grew up in Queens, and you were a high school football player and wrestler, so growing up in very traditional masculine systems of, um, of America. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about how you went from high school athlete, you know, your path, how you knew you were an artist, um, and, uh, yeah, starting there, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And also thank you for providing a little bit more of a backdrop to the conversation. And you know, when I received, when I initially received this uh, question, what was most compelling to me is this idea of exposure. What may have drawn me or drew me to identifying as an artist? And before I even get there, I would also want to say that I don't distinguish myself or the roles that I carry between artists and activists. I don't make that distinction. And we can get into yeah, how and why those are intertwined <laughs> later on in the conversation. But you know, what's, what I need to convey here in terms of my upbringing and how I arrived at being an artist is that I did not have exposure to contemporary art. Other than you, my, the mandatory third grade visit to the Queens Museum, which is in my own backyard, my very first exposure to art in the more traditional fine art sense was the Metropolitan Museum of Art at, at, during high school. I went to an all-boy Jesuit high school. And so, of course, during our programming, we would um, be sent over to the Met. And so what I would, you know, what I would share is that I don't, I still don't know to this day, other than some sort of stubbornness that I likely gained from my mother, what compelled me or encouraged me to see the possibilities of artists. I will say this, however, there's a video that has been circulating heavily, at least in my feeds, of, of Muhammad Ali describing his own upbringing and speaking of how he discovered or question, how he discovered his own uh, pursuit of questioning why everything was white. And I can remember from a very early age from all the pop culture that I was consuming to the saints and depictions of Jesus that surrounded me in my Latin American family to high school, I can remember distinctly and vividly always carrying a sense of wonder as to why so many of these icons and subjects were white. I, well, I, I, I can remember always just questioning to myself and holding that question within as to why all of these heroes, all of these messages, these icons, which were, which were telling me who to be in the world, all had white faces. And so I think there should be no surprise that in my earliest practice, I portrayed myself as these hyper-masculine figures mm -hmm. because I wanted to see my own skin color on the things that I admired as a child, on these subjects that I admired as a child, particularly those that were teaching me how to be a man in American society. And so art became that space to continue mm -hmm. questioning. Mm -hmm. you know? And so it sounds like the activism was always, yeah, can you talk a little bit about the, the nature of them being one and the same, I guess, for you? Sure. And I think I, you know, I wouldn't have identified that role as one that was stitched into my practice until much later on, particularly in the body of, bodies of work that I shared with, with this audience. But I think above all, what is the nature of activism, right? is to continue to push the question that is being overlooked. It's to continue to push the thing that 
larger society or maybe those who have power wish to skip over. And so I think my role as an artist has always been to pose those questions that might be uncomfortable, but I do so by starting with my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. And those definitions in this case of masculinity that attempted to dictate how it was to be a man, particularly in Latin American culture. And I think that role of activism, if I'm going to use it, became more palpable to me, uh, specifically when Trayvon Martin was killed. And there's a personal narrative to that that I, I will share now that I don't often share because it could be misconstrued as the reason I set off on this work. But when I looked at Trayvon's face in the media, it was at the same time my wife and I were discussing having a child. And all these deep-seated, all these deep-seated feelings of fear, particularly growing up to growing up in Queens and being intimidated by, alerted within, and fearful of authority particularly law enforcement, all of this came surging up. And I knew for myself at that point, although it grew gradually as a body of work, I knew that it would be hypocritical for me to continue to address my understandings and definitions of manhood and masculinity, that it would be hypocritical to continue that practice without specifically addressing those definitions that I believe lead to the death of young men of color and young women of color and trans people of color. Those definitions that specifically label us as dangerous, which they're inherently in conscious and unconscious ways lead to our murders. So can you talk a little bit about um, what shifted within your practice um, in that time? Yeah, and it wasn't immediate, but I, I think, you know, really what I started with was just this slow process of seeing myself within the victims that came pouring into our screens. Starting with Trayvon, moving on to Eric Garner and Michael Brown. And so the body of work that has now been collected in the Breath of Matthew space, the exhibition started back in 2014. As a slow process of grappling with those images, first and foremost for myself. Because I needed to see, I needed to experience on some level how I still held that fear as an older man. Mm -hmm. And that how I needed to contend with the fact that that fear would still be transposed onto my child. And that my child would have to navigate those same dangers and risks for being a person of color. And so that's where it all began. It, be, it, it felt like an obligation. Mm -hmm. It felt like an accountability to not only to my work, but whomever I was bringing into this world. And so the breadth of empty space includes um, video, includes the drawings. The drawings are what have caused the censorship. Um, and in a very crude summary of what happened, it was a museum, a white institution um, who received some pushback from black community members um, and canceled the exhibition. And now two of those community members have come forward and, and talked about what makes them uncomfortable in the show, as well as a, a black curator from the museum. Um, in that process, I don't know at what point, you were not told before the museum canceled the show that that was going to happen. Um, the director who was white stepped down and the institution's failings have sort of um, have created this this conflict essentially um, 
had you been given a space to work with the community, um, what do you think might have been possible had the show continued? Had you been aware of the concerns? Um, what could have happened within that space? Okay. So a few clarifying, clarifying points, and then I will speak specifically and zoom out as I promised to do. I think it's important at this point, given the visibility around the pushback and the desire of the two individuals to have their grievances heard that we name, that we name them. Amanda King being the individual, black woman, activist, artist, who was known to represent the interests of Miss Maria Rice, the mother of Tamir Rice, and Latanya Autry, who was a curatorial fellow at the museum at the onset of the exhibition planning. I think this is important. I want to say that in my pub first initial public statement, I specifically did not name names because I was withheld from all of that correspondence. Meaning the correspondence was withheld from me. In other words, I did not know of anyone's role until after the cancellation. So it was important to me that I address specifically the structural institutional failings in holding space for difficult dialogue that would include my voice. And I want to remain specific to that. Any and every individual has the right to perceive their work as they wish. My concern is that the artist, the creator of the work, was not folded into a process of calling in voices. That is a concern. It's also not surprising to me because I, like many practitioners that are BIPOC, have been failed by institutions in this way where we have been held as the possibility of opening the dialogue, have been, our work has been utilized as the wedge for dialogue, for dialogue that should have been taking place in the, well ahead of time, before signing on to the exhibition. Now, to answer your question, I, in sharing this work and in any of my practice, fully commit to a process of calling in the voices and to inviting in the tension. And I think this is incredibly important. I would never have planned to disappear. And actually, I think it's important in any work that engages trauma, and I use that word purposefully, to invite differences. And so what I would have brought, I believe, alongside any of the individuals invested in the Cleveland community, specifically the Cleveland black and brown community, what I believe I could have contributed to was a culture of listening first and foremost, to set the stage for the difficulty, but also to set the stage for the necessary conversations that I believe the work could have inspired, that the work could have been a jumping off point for. That is the purpose of the exhibition. It's not simply to take, take in the drawings itself. It is to utilize it as a space for openness of a dialogue that could not take place in any other social sphere. But I also do wanna say that given the nature of my performance practice, I do also deeply believe in, in the process of embodiment as a form of engagement. And what that would often look like is centering not specific narratives, but removing words altogether. And to instead sense what the tensions are, what the conflict is as told by our bodies, because it's there 
that a different kind of middle ground can be found. The way that trauma is lodged in our bodies, we often don't have the words to articulate where we are and where we find ourselves. And so instead to create that common ground, we have to see what kind of familiarity there is in another person's body. It creates a very different type of platform for discussion because my argument is that words, and this is what we're seeing in the media packaging of the controversy, that language fails us. And so instead to exist in space together, to reckon with the ways that trauma exists in our bodies is a very different starting point. And I would of course have been proud and honored to bring that to any context, any community that I move into. I mean, that's, um, I hate to use this word, but that's sort of the irony of this whole situation is that that's sort of what your work very specifically does is give people space to work through conflicting positions. One of the things your work does. Um, in terms of the drawings, um, and your performance, you've spoken about um, a destabilization. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the specific strategies. I think one of the things that also seemed clear is that people were sort of thinking of art as beauty and not necessarily understanding art as everything else that it can be. And your drawings in are, are powerfully, beautifully rendered. Um, but can you talk about some of the other strategies that you bring to them? Thank you, absolutely. And I'm gonna do so again without the need to be diplomatic or defensive in terms of what has been aired against the work. Let me say this, before we get into the politics of permission and ownership of images, because I do want to get there. I think it's important for everyone on this, that are, that are the number that are listed as participants, to assess the work on your own. And I say this knowing and acknowledging that it is incredibly difficult to read a drawing in the digital sphere. And so I think one of the things that's being lost is a physical experience with this work, particularly as so much of it utilizes a mirrored treatment so that one sees themselves implicated in the work. But to address your question specifically, I believe wholeheartedly and deeply that it is the obligation of an artist to further interrogate these images of death. I think it's also important, and I can't remember if this is addressed in another question, but I'll just get into it now, Sarah. I think what's often misconstrued is the idea that the art is a replica or representation of the thing. So to be specific, we're talking about the traumatic internalization of dash cam footage, cell phone footage, both video and still photography that we receive through the media. And I think it's important to forward the argument that it's constant circulation in the media has both effects of desensitizing us and our own sense of humanity, specifically if we are BIPOC, the continued rendering of us as less than in how we see ourselves in the possibilities of death and killing, that desensitization effect alongside what people will argue is a re-traumatization every time the image comes back up in our feeds. But what we have to understand is that much of the work we see in response is not the thing itself. And this is important. This is, we have to be really careful in looking and assessing what the artwork intends to do. And so in my own practice, 
my approach quite often. And their strategies vary in terms of the body of work. My approach is quite often to select the frame either before, immediately before, or immediately after the most violent moment in that cycle. The most violent moment in the footage, that is. Why? Because in some of the images, not all, it's in that moment that there is a possibility, both literally and metaphorically, of opening up ways, new ways of seeing, and sitting in the pain, sitting in the difficulty, because I argue that there's more to gain out of this image. And now what is it that, that can be gained? When these images of death circulate in the media, it's always accompanied by that media noise, always accompanied by a specific rhythm, a voice of the news anchor. We're never given a moment to quietly be with these images. And now you would ask me, why would we want to do so? Because in the news, in the headlines, so often these events are flattened into a headline. And so what cycles, what circulates is an image that the media has determined for us will be the stand in for the events. By creating spaces in those images to sit with it and look differently, we gain a complexity and in, for, in information that would over, over, otherwise be overlooked or selectively not seen. And so as a way of questioning how we perceive these images, it's a way of really finding a space with, to grapple with them differently. And in my point of view, it's in that difficulty, it's in that new way of looking that we actually find space to heal. Healing is a process and one which requires quite often that we stay with the trauma and that we grapple with it on different terms so that, it, that, so that the story does not run us. But I also want to speak specifically regarding trauma and this idea that artwork of an image has the potential to trigger and therefore re-traumatize. I think we have, need to be really careful with that correlation as it plays out in art because quite often what artists are attempting to do is not just represent what can be found, but contest it, interrogate it, create a rupture within that cycle, within that rhythm, so that we can stay with it differently and find a sense of healing. So what does, in a practical sense, being careful mean? And I think if someone is saying that triggers my trauma, our reaction is to say, okay, we shouldn't look at that. Mm -hmm. Or, but, and, and we don't want to recreate traumas that people have experienced. So what, what, how, how, I mean, what that's is being careful? That's absolutely valid. And I think, uh, you know, what's been mentioned. So there's, there's actually two questions within this question. What happens using the terminology that has been proposed in the scaffolding of care, which I absolutely believe in, in the lead up of any exhibition, particularly as it cater as particularly as it engages traumatic events in our lives in our contemporary lives but also in our historical generational lives and i think uh, you know going back to what we were speaking about earlier that it requires a slowness in calling people into a process not of setting expectations but of looking at the larger role of art 
and understanding that in the difficulty, we can find ways to collaborate, cooperate, and dig through material and, and have conversations carefully, have conversations that hold BIPPOC with care, conversations that I feel are necessary. But also it's the role of the work itself. And I think what's unique about drawing in particular is that it offers a slowness. The tactility of it forces you to stand in front of the image differently and to really work through that information and sense it through it really in a different, outside of rational thought. You internalize the image differently because you're looking at something that was sculpted. And I use the language of sculpture. You're looking at an image that was crafted in front of you with slowness, with deliberation, with integrity and intensity. And I think the drawing has a way of allowing for a different type of reading. And I say this not only as the creator, I say this as someone that has been in space and witnessed it happen for and with people. And so as a person who has committed your life to this work, um, who has thought more in depth and more intensely about this than many, many, many people, um, to receive a cease and desist letter is, um, can you talk about, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know if you can talk specifically about that, um, but I think images have been used, who, I guess, the, I don't know if you want to address that specifically, what that experience well, has been. Let's, or let's go there for a moment because I do believe it points to these larger questions of permission and or right. ownership. And so what I'm, what I'm attempting to do throughout this entire dialogue is open up the questions rather than pose, or I should say, pose an alternative way of looking at these questions. So with, without getting into too much detail of the, of the legality of the issues, I'm going to ask the participants to think about uh, the next series of questions. Is it possible to consider these images of death or I should say, in which ways is it possible to look at these images of death as public versus private? It's a debate that is absolutely necessary and one that I would have welcomed and still do. I think one can argue that as we receive these images in the media, and are forced to reckon with them, that they become a collective trauma. And therefore, it's for each one of us to internalize and deal with and cope with. Now, I understand that there, that, that there is no one way of looking at ownership of these images. But I would really hate to believe that anyone close to art pro production and practice would police the creation of work, especially as it deals with images that are in the public realm, that circulate all around us, and in which we have to contend with. And so I think it's important to delineate the difference between permission to create work and the politics of exhibiting work. And as the work is brought to any community, I'm very aware of what it means to engage a community that has a proximity, and I'm using these words purposefully, 
that there's a proximity to any of these tragedies. And so in, in exhibiting that work, yes, as an artist, I am there, there, therefore forced to think about and contend with the particular dynamics of that institution in its immediate surroundings, but also what it means to exhibit any of those images in the community where it may have occurred. And it was my hope in my initial introductory correspondence to Ms. Rice to open up the possibilities of working with her to think about the presentation of those works in particular or the withholding of that image altogether. Now, why? Not in terms of permission, but again, in terms of what would be most necessary in opening up the dialogue in Cleveland. And by necessary, I mean what critical, what critical conversations would have been most urgent and needed in the moment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that correspondence was barred. And so that conversation, that initial, or that initial opening never occurred. Now, to broaden, to broaden the conversation for a moment, again, I want to ask the participants to think about what it means to, what it means to put parameters around the ownership of any image in the public sphere. Where do we create that, those boundaries? And to what cri criteria? Does the work therefore need to only be felt as or interpreted as a commemoration or celebratory? Where does that line fall? Who vets it? Is it always the responsibility of the victim's families? And then if we expand beyond that, how do we look at any image of trauma and death? Who gains the responsibility in determining the ownership of images in any sphere? I think we have to be really careful about making these parallels. And and again, what I'm going to return to is I'm going to ask everyone to assess what the possibilities are, what are the intended, uh, the intentions, what are the, what is the purpose that you see in the work itself? Because I do believe it changes from piece to piece. Um, I think that gets at the question that came up in the ArtNet talk you did recently mm. about the difference between a presentation of work being honorific um, or being exploitative. And that's not necessarily your question to answer. Um, I think that's the work that institutions need to do and we collectively need to do. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I think above all, I don't think there's a collective answer to that. And I think it changes from individual and individual. And, and as I was stated from the very moment that I unveiled what occurred in this exhibition and what I contend, and I still contend is censorship, that we have to welcome that dialogue, that we have to invite the tensions in. Otherwise, what is the purpose of these stages? What are the purpose of these platforms? Where else can we have this dialogue? And so I would also say that in terms of, you know, th this specific terminology, honorific versus exploitation, that again, we have to assess it from image to image, artwork to artwork. And I believe it's, I, it's neither nor or both end. I think a work can function in many ways. And of course, everyone brings their own perceptions, brings their own experience to the table in the ways that they look. Mm -hmm. 
I think we have, um, do we go to the, I think it's time for questions. Am I? We can thank you, Sean. Questions. Thank you, Sean. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wasn't sure if that was the right time. No, it feels right to me. How do you, okay. how do you what do you feel? I've, I've seen a lot of activity in the chat. So I think people do have some questions and I think this could be a really rich group discussion if we invite some people in. Um, so I think- However you'd like to approach it. Why don't we go to, to some audience questions and we can see where that leads us. Thank you both. What an amazing talk so far. Um, our first question comes from Darla. I am going to turn on your microphone now. You just have to accept the prompt. Darla, are you there? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm just going to repeat the question as I put it into the chat. Um, so I'm a arts writer and cultural critic. I'm thinking about how, uh, you know, I'm just going to go with what you said, Sean. So I'm thinking about how how language comes back in mm. and must mm -hmm. come back in even in the existing together of the work and the actions yes. that you've um, initiated in, in institutional context. Um, and so I'm thinking about how this existing together, specifically in an institutional context, must be contextualized. And as we've seen, you know, with the articles out now, and I have to also say that I uh, want to spend more time with your work. So I, I, I just want to kind of put this out there um, more generally about the possibility of um, where you do see language coming back in. And in this most recent last couple of days, right, we've seen the articles out contextualizing um, the cancellation as a censorship. And so I'm just wondering, um, you know, ways in which you've addressed this since I put the question in the chat, but uh, does calling on censorship need to be specifically contextualized in terms of those whose trauma is, is being re-triggered? Re um, because it does seem like that we want to, you know, make a, make space for the possibility that um, censorship, you know, calling the cancellation of the show censorship is also contributing to that kind of re-triggering of trauma and undermining and gaslighting of those who are triggered. Understood. But I, I believe there are two questions here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna work mm -hmm. backwards mm -hmm. now. Thank you. In terms of addressing specifically my use of the word censorship. I've been very careful and intentional of labeling that as institutional censorship. Mm -hmm. And so again, I carry no grievances, I carry no resistance against those that feel that the work may have been inappropriate for Cleveland in this current context. Those voices absolutely should have the platforms and should be heard. My use of the word institutional censorship has always been pointed to the fact that I have not, I was not included in any of that outreach process. And so in my point of view, and, and, and you know, to be even more specific, that the particular voices as to whom was labeled by the museum black activist community, those voices, those identities were withheld from me altogether. I never, and you know, it's hard for me to share this, but I was not even introduced to Miss Autry during my site visits, during my correspondence, during the, the buildup uh, with, the museum, with the museum. So I just want to detail specifically where I'm locating that word, okay? Because in my point of view, it's in the ways in which those conversations were held invisibly and the triangulation that occurred, that what we're seeing, as I contended in my first public statement, what we are seeing is an inability and unwillingness for the institution to move forward and welcome in the difficult dialogue. It was never posed to me as a postponement, okay? Now, in terms of the inviting the language back in, I think that's incredibly important because in, in my work at Assembly, we also do create the space for language to be invited back in, particularly as it, as it tends to the ways a young person is now articulating their experience with the justice system. Because what we're looking for are the ways in which a young person 
is seeing themselves outside of these preconceived notions and these existing narratives of criminality and therefore describe their circumstances, circumstances, describe their lives using different words. What I would say to you is that in this practice of embodiment that I move forward with not only in my performance practice, but in my community engagement, there's a different kind of starting point that is enabled before we get to open discussion, which utilizes spoken language. It's in, this, it's in this type of embodied practice where we can get more succinctly and intently see what is it that people are saying? What is it that is really being conveyed when they use a word like trauma? Because there's so many ways that that conversation can be interpreted incorrectly and therefore that there be misfires in the dialogue. And so what I attempt to do in any space that I move into with my work is find where is it that we locate fear? Where is it that we locate abandonment, isolation? Where is we locate our experiences of manipulation in our bodies so that we have a different type of starting point, a different type of common ground to move through? I hope that makes sense to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, lots to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darla. Our next question comes from Nicole, and actually a similar question was asked by Orion, so perhaps okay. we can combine them. Um, Nicole, I've asked to turn on your audio. Hi, you can hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much to posting this and especially to Sean for talking. Um, as I kind of wrote earlier in the chat, like I had the honor of actually taking part in one of the I Can't Breathe performances in Charlotte and seeing primitive games. So I feel like I can really attest to some of the things that Sean, that you've said today about that work. And I think you kind of touched on my question a little bit, and I think Orian made it a little more specific, so I'll just ask my portion of the question. Okay. But the idea of like, whose images these are, so who, who does Tamir Rice's image or, uh, you know, Riding King's image actually belong to, came up with the controversy surrounding Dana Schutz and her painting of Emmett Till from the 2017 Whitney Biennial. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want you to talk about another artist's work or for another artist. But I do think this question is kind of surrounding, as you say, the, the drawings that were unfortunately not shown at Mocha Cleveland. And I'm curious if you can touch a little bit further on this idea about them being public, because as you say, they do come from the media. And my sense of these has been that we already see them in the media and somehow we are not getting the point, right? The police are not defunded. The protocols have not changed. People keep dying. So clearly the images on their own are not doing the work. And that's where I see you stepping in powerfully with workshops, performances, drawings, conversations, assembly, teaching, all these things to expand that conversation and to make those images do another kind of work. And so you know, I, like I said, I don't want you to have to respond to someone else's artwork, but I do think this might surround this particular event as well. Absolutely. And I have a very clear narrative around this that I will share with everyone. Um, I'm not sure. Let's stay with this before moving on to or Orion or Orion, even if it's a And yeah, thank you. I don't necessarily want to take up time discussing the Dana Schutz piece, but I do believe that there's a very important thread here because of the analogy of opening up the casket that has been levied against uh, my practice generally. So let me say this. And again, it sort of points to this idea of assessing what the work does. My experience of the Dana Schutz piece, and now my experience doesn't equate with everyone else's. But I pointed out as a way of providing the, the proper backdrop. I was not hurt by that image. The painting itself was an attempt, and I think this is important to name, uh, as it was an attempt to recreate the, the photograph of the open casket 
And so what I believe most people were insulted by specifically was the choice of a white woman to occupy the decision of a black mother in opening the casket and unveiling that tragedy and trauma to the world. Now, the painting itself does not do the work of that photograph. And so the question to me, for me, is why? Why the, the, the trauma that is evoked in me is not due to the painting or my experience of the painting, it's in the memory of that image. And so this is where artwork can, you know, when we talk about the re-triggering effect. But the painting itself doesn't do the work of the photograph. In that, specifically, it wasn't trying to create a different kind of space of looking. Now, again, why? I think I, along with a lot of BIPPOC practitioners, believe it is because the artist in the creation of that work was not contending with her own white identity. And one might argue that that image could not have been represented in any other way that would have created or have been gained more power than the original choice of opening the casket. Now, in terms of my work, I mean, I think you pointed, pointed it out, Nicole. We have to be very, very careful. It's dangerous to use this analogy of opening the casket, specifically because the images in the current contemporary context of how we receive them in the media, these images are not going away. These images based on dash cam footage, based on whatever it might be, they are swirling, they are circulating around us all. So it is not the same as a mother's choice. It is not. And so, the question therefore becomes, in our work, and I say our because there are a number of practitioners that attempt to work through and, and, and contend with these images as they are psych circulated in the media, our responsibility should be in interrogating them further. And in doing so, it's not a representation of that footage. It's in creating a different kind of space. And so when I pursue my practice, there are certain there are certain images that I find for myself that I, I just can't work through. That there is none of that literal and metaphorical space to be found. And so I beg people to see what is the potential of each artwork in creating a different way of grappling with it. Because I still believe if we hand the authority over to the media in owning and handling these images, then we're giving up so much more power. We're giving up all the power. I will also say that this work functions differently for whomever is looking. And so in my practice, I'm specifically finding ways for a black and proud brown person to find a different space in these images. Alongside that, however, I'm also looking for ways for a white person to have to implicate themselves in their own looking and in their own perceptions. And in, in that, the way, as you've said, Nicole, find ways in which we are actually moving people toward action moving people toward reconciliation, or if you're a black and brown body, moving toward healing. Because these images, whether we like it or not, are lodged in our psyche. And something must be done about it. And we, we forget that racialized trauma and racial inheritance of trauma exists in black and brown bodies and white bodies. <laughs> 
and for white bodies to look away continues that deniability and therefore reaffirms the American narrative of whiteness. And I don't believe, I believe that that should be contended with as well as an artist. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Nicole, for your question. Thank you, Nicole. Our next question comes from The Rail's own Fong Bui. Fong, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Sarah, um, it's, uh, I just want to remind <laughs> ourselves a little bit here. I remember super clearly when um, Sensation Show at the Brooklyn Museum in, I think it might have been in, uh, was it 94 or 99? I think it was 99 when Giuliani, without even made the effort to come to see Chris Ophelia, Black Madonna, mm. um, just because it was brought up that the, the support was made out of elephant dung. And that's all it took. If Chris Ophelia might have been a white man, I don't think that would be the case. Hmm. And the threat to, it was indeed froze the city funding. You know, the, the point I'm saying is that same thing that if you go back further the history, censorship is very intense. I mean, Jack Smith Flaming Creature, 1963, when it was made, performer dressed in elaborate drags and appear in several is conducted scene, orgy and earthquake and whatnot. When it was shown in March 19, the uh, following year, Jonas Makers, along with Ken Jacobs and his future wife, Florence Cop, were arrested. And it was Susan Sontag came along and support Jonas and the whole entire intellectual in New York, including my Shapiro, you know, Lionel Trillin, many endless other came to support Jonas on this subject. What did he do? When later, Jean Genet, the only film he ever made, it's called Au Chien L'Amour, you know, two homosexual, really, prisoner, having an erotic relationship, separate by a war. He was put, went to Supreme Court. Same thing with Barney Rosett, our most admired friend, defender of First Amendment. When he, um, Publish D.S. Lawrence, Lady Charlie's Lover, and also in the same year, uh, you know, Tropic and, Tropical, Cancer, Tropical Cancer, D.S. Lawrence went to Supreme Court. He won both cases. My point is, it go further back. I can name you a, a zillion other example, but it went back beginning uh, when the, 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 the end of the Second War. Basically, McCarthyism was created. The same thing with CAI was created to facilitate, to keep a tap on communistic activity. That was when the House Un-American um, Activities Committee was created, you know, and homosexual also were considered, a, or at least classified as a psychiatric disorder in the 50s. Many great people like Leonard Bernstein was gay, Arnold Ginsberg was gay, you know it. I mean, there's so many other people uh, was censor, was a victim of that. My point is that we also had to be reminded again, one brave Republican senator from mm. Maine. If you don't remember her name, do remember. She's amazing. Margaret Chase Smith, who gave the most important speech on declaration of conscience. Very important, the right to criticize, the right to uphold unpopular belief, the right to protest, the right of independent thought. It's very important that we try to remember that history. So we're here to support you, Sean, for what you do. That's the so it's not a question. I just want to remind ourselves yes. about this. No, the historical context is super important. And you know, let me just say this. And Fung, 
uh, I have said this to you privately, but your words during, you know, two weeks in, in the invitation to this, your words have saved me in a lot of ways. Thank you for your knowledge and for your, um, just your care in all this. Well, we, let me say this. Yeah. Back to you, Lewis Block. <laughs> <laughs> let me say, let me say one thing here. I will never defend myself against or fight against whether, whether in the media or otherwise, against anyone that is hoping to do the work of protecting themselves and their own communities. What I lament is that I never had that moment to grapple with these issues, with these individuals. Everyone and anyone can bring whatever they wish in their perceptions of my work. That what artwork is meant to do. And I just hope that we all come away with a deep conviction in allowing artwork to guide us through the shit because that's what's necessary. Because the opposite, the alternative, is that things get pushed away as they have been. And now we have this reduced one-dimensional argument playing out in the media. And I should also point out the laziness of these two outlets to, between the two of them to reproduce one drawing to not allow people to set their own minds as to what the possibilities of the work are. And so I say to anyone, um, let's do the work together. That if this is not the moment for Cleveland, let's find the moment that it, that it is. Well, as Jonas Makers once say, um, the meanings and the Values of art are not decided in courts or prison. Yeah, right on. Thank you, Fawn. Thank you, Sean. Um, we have John Chach, the curator of the show in attendance, and I wanted to go over to him next. And uh, I think he had a question in the chat. John, are you there? Hi, thank you. Hi, John. Um, um, my question is actually kind of maybe even loops back to the original context of Sean's practice and the exploration of masculinity and uh, fears around black and brown bodies and that wondered if you could talk about um, the place for the Central Park Five series of drawings in the breath of empty space and that they're unique in that they aren't depicting they aren't depicting a moment of potential physical violence at the hands of police or lives lost to that but lives lost to a greater violence to systemic oh. violence mm -hmm. and um, i'm wondering if you could help us connect that in the um the narrative of the show your practice the larger systemic you know the zooming out as you put it yeah thank you john thank thank you so much i you know and this is incredibly important because to exist in the space with the drawings tells a very different narrative, as you're pointing out, because there are works that contend with the larger violence of the American legal system. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hoping to do with some of these and the ways in which these works speak to another is illuminate how the court system feeds into policing, how policing feeds into the criminalization of young and uh, young black and brown people as they navigate the streets and how they are all intertwined systemically as a violence of racism, systemic racism as so widely shared. And so the Central Park Five, along with the Attica piece, which actually, mm. which also does not depict a moment of, of violence being enacted and yet it does mm. because in the central park five piece 
and I'll give a very quick anecdotal uh, story as to how I arrived at that piece. What you will find more often than not, when you look up the Exonerated Five or the Central Park Five or the Central Park Jogger case, those three will give you very different searches. But when you look up Central Park Five, the very first thing that still pulls up and therefore exists in our collective consciousness is their mugshot. And so I'm going back to you, Nicole, there are certain images that are not meant to create rupture within, that are not meant to be imploded. So I don't touch the mug shots. Instead, you dig deeper and you find this incredible court scene. And this, I need to trace this back to the Rodney King drawing in the show soon and as in a moment as well. The court scene is so often cropped to show five young boys sitting in a row. Those five young boys encapsulate this narrative of culpable young boys sitting in a courtroom. Of those five boys, only two of them are of the Central Park Five. And so we have to start questioning how the media frames and therefore moves this, these images out into the world for us to remember. And that's where the investigation, that's where the interrogation comes in. In the larger scene, you actually find the other three members sitting elsewhere in the courtroom. You only see that when you expand the information and allow for a slowness. In the same way that when you research Rodney King, what you quite often will get nine times out of 10 is a sharply cropped image of two officers beating on that body. A body, I, I should say, is not present within the drawing. Why? Because in the larger image, the image that does not circulate in our collective consciousness, we see 11 officers in the scene, three of which actually make contact to Rodney King's body, the other, a fourth, which is the supervisor, and therefore those four are brought into court, none of which were charged. But so the question then becomes, why in our collective consciousness do we only remember four images, four, four individual police officers, when there were 11 guilty officers at that scene? So my investigation, my, the way I insert myself, is to bring that information that is overlooked and to question the media's role in what circulates in our collective consciousness and therefore exists from that point on. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, John. Thank you both. I think we have time for one more question and it's going to come from Everett. Everett, can you turn on your audio? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, let me just write it down. Um, so in your performance, without language, do you have a, a particular conception of truth? Um, and if it's bodily, does it exist beyond trauma? And, and what is a bodily truth that doesn't source itself in trauma and how? Uh, re, uh, say the last part again, I'm sorry. Um, uh, what is a bodily truth that doesn't source itself in trauma and how? What is a bodily truth that does not source itself in trauma? Okay, let me back up a little bit for you, Everett, okay. and describe the way that my practice, both drawing, performance, and everything, everything else I do, intersects with behavioral sciences, cognitive therapy, and the study of trauma. What we now know is that trauma is called up not in the same way that memory is. It's actually lodged in a different part of the brain. And so therefore what is called up is actually in segments and spurts, which is why we often only see for ourselves bits of information, quite often it is the detail that then elicits an automatic response. The trauma, the trauma that manifests itself in a quite often a physical response. And so to answer your question, what we therefore, or I should say art's capacity in intersecting with this science is to help individuals sense why that automatic response is being called up. 
what is actually being orchestrated by the body. Because quite often when we have this automatic response, we don't even notice that it's happening. And so the closing in or the defensiveness or the anger, whatever it might be, is there's a disassociation because we don't have a cohesive memory to hold on to and attach to the response. So the way that I think draw, both the drawings and performance can function is in dialing into a more essential character or emotive space at the heart of that story. So rather than resolving or trying to construct a narrative, all we're, what, we, what performance and also in our capacity of looking, what it can dial into is oftentimes just one word, the way that individual felt. Because it's, again, to back up, it's incredibly difficult to name a trauma. And so if we can, through performance, through embodied language, name, I felt lonely, I felt hurt, I felt abandoned, whatever it might be, then that body and psyche is not trying to make sense of the narrative, but holding on to it differently. And you can start to make connections with what you are doing in your body and therefore projecting out into the world. And then in the philosophy of my work that is connected to like somatic principles, the body can lead the way to change. The body can actually create that path for who you want to be in the world. So if your automatic response is closing in, being more attuned to that and naming it then allows you to move differently and decide for yourself, this is not who I want to be in the world. It's not the work of therapy is the work of freeing and healing. And that is still within arts capacity. Thank you, Sean. Everett, thank you for, for bringing, that, bringing this conversation to that question. Oh, thank you. That was, I'm going to ruminate on that. I very much appreciate it. Right on. Thank you everyone for your questions. Um, and thank you, Sarah and Sean, for a wonderful conversation. We have a tradition at the rail of ending our lunches with a poem and we've carried that into these community events. Uh, and today we're thrilled to welcome Sarah Sala to the stage. Sarah Sala is a poet, educator and native Michigander. The author of Devil's Lake from Tolson Books out this year. She is the founding director of Office Hours Poetry Workshop and assistant editor for the Bellevue Literary Review. Her work appears or is forthcoming in Baum, the Brooklyn Rail, Michigan Quarterly Review, and the Southampton Review. She teaches expository writing at NYU, and she lives in Washington Heights. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, can y'all hear me okay? What an amazing conversation, Sean and Sarah. I've, I've taken so much sustenance from it. Um, and it just reminds me of, of how we go through the world and, and to be meticulous in, in thinking through how how we can process this world and, and really interrogate it as well. Uh, a lot of my work for this new collection um, is thinking about violence in the American landscape and queerness in nature. And it was just Pride Month, so that's the place that I'm, I'm coming from when I read. So this first poem is called Nature Versus Nature. It can be read two different ways on the page. Before I was born, my original face radiated light, weather, organisms, landforms, celestial bodies, everything untouched by humans. And there's a second way to read this. Before I was born, my original face was queer too. Radiated light, weather, organisms, landforms, celestial bodies, unbound by nature, everything untouched by humans. Uh, there's a series of erasures that I'd love to read too. Um, I received a homophobic letter uh, from someone close to me uh, when I announced my wedding. So instead of sitting with that private shame that I felt like I was supposed to have, I did the only thing that I knew how to do was process that into art. So I made a blackout poem where you can block out um, parts of the text and allow other 
voices or you know what what's really there to come through so there's three versions performed on the the same text on receiving a homophobic letter a series of erasures version one my dear I wish I spent more time living, but I've never understood how. Recently, I grabbed a pen. I worked on the answer to my life. I felt a jet, a magnet, a pancake, a chair, a doormat in every cell, every molecule in my body. I'm not sure how. All I can say is I'm super not special. I used to talk to almost anyone and feel great love. I plead to you go against the fullness you were meant to have. So that's version one. Here's version two, same text. Sarah, you are unbelievable. You know everyone. You came to mind because I didn't know what to do. At the age of 18, I decided to go down south. I spent three years in my kitchen. Unexplainingly, I lay there with no body. When I stood and said, I really don't know you but you better get your seatbelt on. And I am now filled with his children. I'm so used to miracles, I can't even talk about them. Version three, same text. Sarah, you are my heart. I wish I spent more time to get to know you. At 20, the angels I thought were helping me had to go. Everything was going south in my marriage. I was in a jet blast with no feeling. I'm not sure how long it was. You're turning a new page. I feel great love for you. You are my heart. You, you, you. And I'll end with just one poem here. Interior versus exterior. At my worst, I control the boundaries of my form. And yet when divine, the self permeates the physical world. It's true, the atoms of our bodies grieve each other in death, just like a color doesn't occur alone, but takes meaning from other colors. The moon was a changeable star that ruled men's fate. Water was green and not blue to medieval cartographers. The complexity of ochre begs the viewer to grapple with it. We are swiftly becoming an indoor species, yet scientists know more about outer space than the Earth's oceans. Humans brought the natural world into their homes to combat the rise of machines. Without us knowing, trees converse via lattice fungi. Gender isn't something one is, but performs. We are a vast assembly of nerve cells, the continents longing for each other. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah, that was wonderful. I see a bunch of hands silently clapping in the grid. Um, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sarah. What an amazing conversation. And thank you, everyone, for joining. We hold these every weekday at 1 p.m., uh, so make sure to join us next Monday for a talk between Arlene Sheckett and Raymond Foy. On your way out, if you want to unmute yourself, turn on your mic and say goodbye, you're welcome to. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Powerful work. I happen to be at the opening in, at MICA. I remember your face. <laughs> uh, uh, great seeing you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sean. Great poem, Sarah. Great poem. Wonderful poem, Sarah. Showing us too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Hey, Lloydie.